All right, well, it's good to be with you. I hope you can all hear me clearly. And uh, of course, I want to wish you all a, a, a blessed new year and trust that this will be a fruitful new year for all of you uh, in your service for the Lord Jesus. I'd like to uh, turn with you in the scriptures to the prophecy of Isaiah. Uh, I know you've been going, working your way through that book, and we're going to be breaking in in chapter 59. And I want to do two readings from chapter 59. I'd like to read the whole thing, but for the sake of time, I'm going to read verses 1 through 8, and then the second part of verse 15 to the end of the chapter. Uh, so beginning in chapter 59 of Isaiah, chapter 1, we read these words, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood, your fingers with iniquity, your lips have spoken lies, your tongue hath muttered perversenesses. None calleth for justice, nor any pleadeth for truth. They trust in vanity and speak lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. They hatch cockatrice eggs and weave the spider's web. He that eateth of their eggs dieth and that which is crushed breaketh out into a viper. Their webs shall not become garments, neither shall they cover themselves with their works. Their works are works of iniquity, and the act of violence is in their hands. Their feet run to evil, they make haste to shed innocent blood, their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity, wasting and destruction are in their paths. The way of peace they know not. And there is no judgment in their goings. They have made them crooked paths. Whosoever goeth therein shall not know peace. And then verse 15. And I want to break into the second part of the verse where it says this. And the Lord saw it and it displeased him that there was no, that there was no judgment. And he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his arm brought salvation unto him, and his righteousness, it sustained him. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate, and a helmet of salvation upon his head. And he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing, and was clad with zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, according he will repay fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies. To the islands he will repay recompense. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. And the Redeemer shall come to Zion and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord, my spirit that is upon thee. And my words, which I have put in thy mouth, shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us this morning. And of course, you might immediately ask, well, what is all this about? And I want to tell you that this passage is marvelous because it's about the future conversion of the nation of Israel. There's a day coming when a nation will be born again in one day. And this is what this chapter is about. And Israel's conversion is like anyone's conversion in one sense, although it's going to be on a bigger scale because it's going to be a whole nation rather than an individual. But the things that we find in this chapter are true of every individual conversion. And of course, as we enter into 2022, wouldn't it be wonderful if this would be a year where we see many genuine, old-fashioned, real conversions where people come to saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? And that's what we want to see. So what does it look like? What does conversion really look like? Well, we want to notice that in verses 1 through 8, it's really about conviction. If you want a three-point outline, this is going to be a three-point outline message. 
verses one through eight, conviction. And of course, nobody ever gets converted who doesn't first become convicted of the seriousness of their sinful condition. And so this passage, the prophet lays out uh, in a very clear way, the sinfulness, the exceeding sinfulness of the people of Israel. And of course, Paul would later take it up in Romans chapter 3 and apply the very same passage to the whole human race and show that the whole world is guilty before God and condemned and every mouth is going to be stopped and, and all the world guilty before God. So a very, very convicting passage, as you would imagine about sin and the seriousness of sin and the horror of sin and uh, so it's it's conviction and that's uh, always happens somebody gets converted they first become convicted and then we're going to see the second section verses 9 through 15 their conviction results in their confession they're convicted about their sin and they are willing to acknowledge it and so we're going to see here the the remnant in Israel are going to confess clearly their sinfulness. They're going to own it. They're going to say, yes, we're guilty. We have sinned. And then from verses, uh, the final section, the first part of verse 15 that we read to the end of the chapter, we're going to see their conversion. And their conversion is going to occur not by them as they have sought to do, going about seeking to establish their own righteousness, but they're going to have to look to another. They're going to have to look to the one who's going to save them, the Lord from heaven, the Lord Jesus, who is going to be their deliverer. And as we read in another passage that's a parallel to this chapter, they're going to look upon him whom they have pierced, and they're going to mourn for him. They're going to realize we've crucified our own Messiah, and then God will open their eyes and show them that it was for their sin that he died and they will be genuinely converted. And so, oh, wouldn't it be wonderful if this year, 2022, would be a year where we would see people come under deep conviction of sin. We would see people willing to admit it and to own their sin and confess it. And we would see people who look to Christ and Christ alone, the uplifted savior, the wounds, seeing that he died, shed his precious blood to save them and trusting in him. Well, that's what this exciting chapter is about but we want to put it in the rightful context just as uh, a prophet loves to denounce sin that's part of his calling it's not only to tell the future but it's to denounce sin and to proclaim the sinfulness of sin and isaiah has been doing that throughout this book as you no doubt have noticed but in chapter 57 the immediate chapters uh, he condemned their adulterous paganism going up to the mountains uh, to, the, to every high hill and offering uh, offerings to the various gods, the idolatrous state of the nation. And so he condemns their idolatry, their pagan practices in chapter 57. In chapter 58, he condemns their hypocritical fasting. Uh, they, they were fasting, but it was all for show. It, it, was, it wasn't genuine. There was no reality in them seeking the Lord. It was just a big act. It was a big show. So hypocritical fasting. And, and in this chapter, his concern and what he is convicting them of more than anything else is the fact of their, uh, their injustice, that, that they're not being just in the way that they're dealing with one another, in where, the way they're dealing with the poor. Uh, there's great injustices uh, in the nation, and he's going to condemn that and pronounce judgment and denounce judgment on their sin. Also, the reason I mentioned chapter 57, 58, 59 is that all three chapters are also about prayer that is heard, but not answered by God. Uh, all prayers heard, but not all prayer is answered. And God hears, uh, his ear is not shortened, as we're going to see in this chapter, uh, that, that he, or his arm is not shortened, that he can't save, and his ear uh, it can hear, he, he, he can hear. Uh, but he refuses to hear because of their sin. And if you like, a parallel is this. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. In other words, he's not going to answer a prayer uh, when there's no reality or sincerity in the person who brings that prayer. 
And so in chapter 57, he didn't answer prayer because they were asking it to the wrong people. They were, they were basically looking to their idolatrous gods to answer their prayer. So clearly it wasn't answered. Uh, chapter 57, 13, when thou criest, let thy companies deliver thee, but the wind shall carry them all away. Vanity shall take them away. He that putteth his trust in me shall possess the land and then shall inherit my holy mountain. They'd be looking elsewhere rather than to him. And of course, the people, they, the false deities they were crying out to could not and would not be able to answer their prayer. And he wasn't going to answer it because they were not coming to him with their requests. They were looking in the wrong place. Chapter 58, their petitions uh, are rejected because of their hypocrisy. He says in verse four, behold, you fast for strife and debate and to smite with the fist of wickedness. Ye shall not fast as you do this day and make your voice to be heard on high. Their voice couldn't be heard on high because their fasts were just pure hypocrisy. And in this chapter, we see that because of their injustice, he will not answer their prayer. So he mentions in verse one, Behold, 59.1, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. So it's not that God can't save them, and it's not that he can't hear them, but then he says, but, contrast, your iniquities have separated between you and your God, your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. And so basically, Here's a people, and they're, they're really not lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, as we're told in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. They're coming with blood on their hands. Uh, the injustice, the way they've treated one another, uh, means that God is not hearing them. Their sins, their iniquities have separated them from their God. And as we said, this chapter not only is speaking about the nation of Israel, but Paul would take up uh, the gist of this chapter, this especially the first eight verses, then he would apply it in Romans chapter three to the universal guilt of all mankind. You see, Israel are like a batch sample. Uh, they, uh, God took them and said, look, I, I'm going to show you. Uh, it's like in a factory uh, when they when they do quality control, uh, they don't sample every piece that they make. They, they take a sample. And if the sample's bad, the assumption is it's all bad. And so Israel is this sample. And their kind of sample is, is clearly bad. Uh, they had all opportunities. Every blessings uh, that God could convey was conveyed upon them. And yet they were rotten to the core. And God says, if, if, if this batch sample is sick, then the whole of humanity is sick. Because they're just an example. And so Romans 3 would use these very verses to put the whole world on trial and condemn the world for its guilt in Romans 3, verses 15 through 17, resulting in that climax statement, every mouth will be stopped and all the world guilty before God. So we said God is able to save them and he's also able to hear them, but he cannot because of their sinfulness. And it's kind of interesting that the salvation theme in this chapter. I want you to notice in verse one, it says that the Lord's hand is not shown that it cannot save. And so he's a God who can save. He's able to save. We believe that he's able to save to the uttermost. He can save. But in verse 11, he says, uh, we roar like bears and mourn saw like doves. We look for judgment. But there is none for salvation, but it is far from us. See, God's able to save, but he hadn't saved them at this point. But then verse 16, we read of a day coming when he will save them. It says, and he saw that there was no man, wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his arm brought salvation unto him, his righteousness. It sustained him. And so he did ultimately and will ultimately save his people, as we see in verse 16. And as a result of the salvation that's described in verses 16 through 21, Israel will enjoy the rich blessings that are going to be detailed in Isaiah chapter 60. 
And I can't wait to get there. I'm really excited about chapter 60. It's going to describe the millennial reign of Christ and how Israel are going to be treated in the last days in that thousand year reign. And it's, it's thrilling to read, and, uh, but they're going to have to come through this period of conviction and confession and conversion before they can enter into the full blessings that God has for them in chapter 60. So we saw uh, their iniquities, verse 2, have separated between you and your God. And it is true that sin prevents prayer from being answered. Psalm 66, 18, we know it well. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. So if we want our prayers answered in 2022, we better make sure that our, our hands are clean, that we're, we're coming and lifting up holy hands in the presence of God, that we're not involved in sin, that we're living lives of holiness if we want to have our prayers uh, heard and answered by God. And I want to, as he begins to describe their depravity, I want you to notice that he's using kind of different parts of their body uh, to describe the, the sinfulness. Of, and he's basically saying uh, this sin has affected every area of them. And so he says in verse three, your hands are defiled with blood, your fingers with iniquity, your lips have spoken lies, uh, tongue hath muttered perverseness. Uh, down again in verse six, at the end of verse six, act of violence is in their hands. In verse seven, their feet run to evil. And then it's not just the fact that it's their, their hands and their, their mouth and, and, and their feet that are all involved in sin, but it, where does it all begin? It begins in their thoughts. Notice verse seven, he says, their feet run to evil, they make haste to shed innocent blood, their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity, wasting and destruction are in their paths. Of course, the Bible is very clear, isn't it? It tells us that as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And so the very fact that their thought life is wrong, it means that their their physical actions are wrong. Their words, their deeds are all affected by corrupted thoughts. And so it begins in the mind. It's interesting that Israel's high priest wore a bonnet. And on the front of the bonnet, there was a gold plate that was inscribed. And it said on it, holiness unto the Lord. And of course, it's placed on the head. And the idea is this. If your mind is holy, your whole person will be holy. As a man thinks, so is he. And so he describes them and he's showing the utter corruption. Uh, basically, the depravity of man is brought out to us here. Israel had sinned in deed and in word and in thought. And because of the intensity of their sin, the Lord had not heard them. They lifted their hands to worship God, but their hands were stained with blood. It says, your hands are defiled with blood, your fingers with iniquity. Uh, they, they weren't holy hands. They, they were dirty hands. Uh, they'd been involved in bloodshed. They'd been involved in iniquity in every, every way. And of course, uh, the nation of Israel, uh, they, they do, Scripture says... <laughs> Uh, because of what they have done, have very wicked hands. And I want to point a scripture to us in the book of Acts. Just keep your finger in Isaiah, but I want to read a verse from Acts chapter 2 and Peter's sermon in the day of Pentecost and what he says about their hands. And what it's a kind of an interesting statement, but it says they've been involved in a very serious sin. He says, him, speaking of the Lord Jesus, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. And so this nation, their hands are filled with blood. Not just any old blood, but the blood of the Redeemer, God's Savior sent into the world, and they by wicked hands have slain. And so guilt, but it's true of all of us, 
Our hands have done things they ought not to have done. Uh, our mouths have spoken things that should never have been said. And our feet have taken us to places that we ought never have gone. Notice he says in verse 7, their feet run to evil. They make haste to shed innocent blood. See, their feet should have been used for a, a much holier purpose. Instead of making haste to shed innocent blood, running to do evil, what their feet ought to have been doing is carrying the message of the one who came to shed his precious blood, the Lord Jesus. Isaiah 52, 7, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith to Zion, thy God reigneth. And may this year be a year where our feet, instead of being swift running towards evil, making haste to shed innocent blood, how we, our feet need to be swift in proclaiming, beautiful feet, proclaiming the message of the one who came from heaven and shed his precious blood so that man might be redeemed. Our feet are to be shod with the preparation of the gospel of feet, of peace. And that's what the message we should be proclaiming. And may 2022 be a year when we are bold in sharing that message of redemption through the work of the Lord Jesus and his shed blood. And so as he speaks of these people, one of the great concerns in verse four is that none calls for justice, nor any pleadeth for truth. It seems like the nation is so corrupted that nobody is asking for justice. Nobody's pleading for truth. Uh, they're all conceiving mischief. And he uses some kind of descriptive language here to describe the corruption of their lives. And, and he's using these little word pictures. He, he says that first they're like pregnant women, but they're giving birth to sin. So notice that, that language that he, that he uses here. Uh, he says they conceive mischief, uh, bringing forth mischief. And so giving birth to sin. James talks about that sin conceiving, bringing a lust conceiving, bringing forth sin. And so this is what they're doing. And then he talks about them being like snakes, hatching their eggs, uh, the cockatrice eggs. And uh, of course, uh, when the <coughs> people eat the eggs, they die because they're, well, they're vipers in them. And then talks about spinning webs uh, like a spider uh, to uh, webs of lies and deceit, basically. And so he's, he's using descriptive language to show uh, how he views sin. It's not just some misdemeanor. It's utterly destructive. It's evil. Uh, it's like a serpent. Uh, it's like uh, something that, that brings destruction in every way, evil, deadly. Uh, terrible thing. And so he's, he's basically denouncing sin and showing the seriousness of it. And, uh, and of course, it, it's counterproductive. Uh, so for instance, when he talks about uh, these uh, webs, verse six, that uh, he says, their webs shall not become garments, neither shall they cover themselves with their works. Their works are works of iniquity and the act of violence is in their hands. And so it's a picture of uh, clothing yourself with a spider's web. It's pretty useless. Uh, it didn't do you much good. It wouldn't do me much good here today if I was clothed in a spider's web, especially because it was minus 11 Celsius this morning. And I don't think a spider's web would have done me much good. And the idea is simply this, that sin is counterproductive. It doesn't bring any good, any benefit, any blessing at all sin is rotten it spoils it's destructive in all its ways and that there's nothing good that comes from it really it's, it's just rotten to the core and so he concludes in verse 8 
with this simple statement, the way of peace have they not known. Of course, there, there's a reason for that, because peace is always connected in Scripture with righteousness. And where there's no righteousness, there's no peace. And, and it's just a, it's a, it's a f- fundamental theme. In fact, I remember speaking at 100 Mile House and the, the conference uh, theme was, was the idea of peace. And I found it fascinating. Every passage I looked at, I saw this amazing connection between righteousness and peace. No righteousness, no peace. And so the way of peace they have not known. Why? Because, because of the, the lack of righteousness, because of the wickedness in their lives. And, and it says, uh, the way of peace they know not. There is no judgment or justice in their goings. They have made them crooked paths. Whoever goes therein shall not know peace. And of course, the Bible's clear, isn't it? The way of the transgressor is hard. And there is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. And of course, the nation had basically sown uh, this evil and they had reaped uh, chaos. Uh, their constant invasions constant difficulties uh, across the nation because there's no righteousness and therefore, as a consequence, there is no peace. Again, Paul would quote this very verse in Romans 3 and verse 17, which leads us to the second section. We didn't read this section, but it's one of confession. And one of the things I, I should have pointed out, and I want to do it quite quickly here, and that is one of the things you have to pay attention to in this chapter is the various pronouns that are used. And so in the first section, in verses two and three, I want you to just notice he talks about you and your. Your iniquities, verse two, have separated between you and your God. Your sins have hid his face from you. Uh, Verse three, your hands uh, are defiled with blood. Your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue hath muttered perverseness. And so the prophet's pointing out their, uh, if you like, their individual guilt. It's, it's your hands, your lips. And then in verse 4 uh, through basically verse 8, it's they. And so he's talking about their collective guilt. None calls for justice, nor any pleadeth for truth. They trust in vanity and speak lies. They conceive mischief. They hatch cockatrice's eggs. And I won't take the time to go through it but you can see all the way through the way of peace they know not verse eight there's no judgment in their goings and so uh, the emphasis is on that collective guilt individual guilt collective guilt the nation as a whole is guilty but now we get from verse 9 to 15 and we're on the theme of confession and the language changes and it's us and we and our is the new language that is found here. We, us, and our. And what we find in verse 9 through 15, it's a faithful remnant within the nation that now begin to own the guilt of the nation. And they begin to confess the sin of the nation as their own. A bit like when Daniel prayed in Daniel chapter 9, uh, and he talks about how we have sinned. And yet you look at Daniel's life, it's hard to find anything in his life. But he, as it were, uh, stands and owns the sin of the nation as his own. And so we find this faithful remnant confessing their sins here. And so from verse 9 onwards, we'll see this. And so notice it says, therefore, is judgment far from us, neither does justice overtake us. We wait for light, but behold obscurity for brightness, but we walk in darkness. We grope for the wall like a blind. We grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday, and as in the night, we are in desolate places as dead men. Of course, the great emphasis on light and darkness. Isaiah talks a lot about it. So does the Apostle John. He talks about the contrast between light and darkness. And so basically, the light is of course to do with truth and eternal life darkness is connected with evil and he's saying basically they confess we're stumbling in the dark we're in a very dark place this godly remnant is confessing the sin of the nation and acknowledging it like others have done before and and confessing 
uh, how they're blind, they're in the dark, uh, they're, they need help, they're, they're desperate. In, in fact, in verse 11, he says, we roar all like bears and mourn, saw like doves. We look for judgment, but there's none for salvation, but it's far from us. Very descriptive language, we mourn like bears. And the suggestion is uh, that the, in their great affliction, the remnant are roaring like a hungry bear that has in early spring has just come out of hibernation and is absolutely starving and it's roaring. And so they're like that they're, They've been in the dark for so long. Uh, it, it, they've been in, uh, in a bad place and they're, they're coming out of that and they're crying out uh, like a roar. They're mourning uh, like a dove. There's a mourning note to it as well. And so they're, they're crying out, mourning saw like doves. We're looking for judgment, looking for justice, but there's none. The nation, it was, there was none in the nation. It reminds us a little bit about the day we find ourselves in. It seems like uh, that evil is prospering and that good uh, is, is failing in the land. And, and it seems there's little justice and evildoers seem to get away with things and uh, people who are righteous are looked down very negatively in our society. And so they're, they're seeing this and they're, they're mourning, they're looking for justice, there's none, they're, they're looking for salvation, but it's far from us. And then they acknowledge the reason for these things. Verse 12, for our transgressions are multiplied before thee. Our sins testify against us. Our transgressions are with us. Our iniquities, we know them. And so they come to this place where they willingly, knowingly acknowledge their sin and their guilt. And nobody will ever be converted who doesn't come to this place where they acknowledge their sin and their guilt, where you come to that place where you say, I have sinned. Lord, forgive me. I am the sinner that Jesus died to save. There's got to be that recognition of owning our own guilt. And they do. This remnant. They confess it. They're, they're willing to do that. Verse 13, in transgression and lying against the Lord and departing away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart's words of falsehood. Yes, we've sinned against you, Lord. We've rebelled against you. We've gone our own way. And judgment, they say, verse 14, is turned away backwards. And justice standeth afar off. Truth is fallen in the street. Inequity cannot enter. Departure from God has so endangered the very fabric of national life. It's affected every area. There's no justice. Uh, truth is hard to come by anymore. Uh, the whole of the nation has been affected by sin. And we have to recognize uh, why is Canada the state it's in and the United States right now? It's because of sin. That's why we're in the mess we're in. It's because of the sin of the nation. And, and departing from God endangers the very fabric of national life. Moral absolutes have disappeared. Public morality has collapsed. Society has no time for justice and judgment and truth and equity. Uh, the whole thing seems to be collapsing under the weight of sin and rebellion. In the nation through this faithful remnant, and now acknowledging their sin and guilt. Notice uh, in verse 15, it says, Yea, truth faileth, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey. It's interesting. He that departs from evil makes himself a prey or a victim. It was society has become so wicked that it has no time at, at all for anybody who is serious about sin, who's loyal to the laws of God. Such people are looked down on. They, they, they're branded as fundamentalist bigots, as extremists. They're vilified. They're ridiculed. 
And that's exactly how things were in the nation of Israel and will be in a coming day when anybody that dares to stand for righteousness will be vilified, will be ridiculed. And of course, we see some of that in our society, a society where evil is proclaimed good and good is proclaimed evil. Woe to such a nation. And that's where we find ourselves. And that's the way it was here. And so it says in verse 15, part B, and this is the good part. This is where conversion comes to this repentant, broken, faithful remnant. Notice it says in verse 15, it says, the Lord saw it and it displeased him that there was no judgment. Isn't it good to know that the Lord sees? The Lord sees the lack of justice in our land. The Lord sees the things that are happening. And it's not pleasing to him. Sin does not bring any pleasure to him. Society crumbling at its very fabric brings no delight to his heart. And so the Lord saw it. It displeased him. There was no judgment. And he also saw there was no man and wondered there was no intercessor. And his arm brought salvation to him. Now, the word intercessor here is not to be used in the narrower sense as somebody who's going to be a prayer warrior, but it's, it's the idea of a broader sense of there's no, nobody, uh, no representative or defender who will stand up. Uh, he's looking for somebody to stand in the gap, somebody to stand up, and he says he couldn't find anybody. And so it, it's, a, it's a terrible condition. Uh, the nation's in, in a powerful state and there there's nobody willing to stand and so the lord says okay in the absence of anybody who's willing to intercede anybody who's willing to stand up he said i'm going to do it it says therefore his arm brought salvation unto him he, he couldn't just stand there looking. He steps in. He's going to step in and do something. And of course, what we're going to see here is really, this is picturing what's going to be like in the very last days. Wickedness is going to, we think it's bad today. We haven't seen anything yet. After the church is raptured, the world is going to enter into depths of wickedness that are unimaginable. And there's going to be nobody standing up, but the Lord says, I'm going to step in. And he's going to come in on behalf of this godly remnant that are crying out, that are confessing the sin of the nation. And he is going to step in for their deliverance. And so this confession is followed by divine intervention. And we see it in verse 20. Uh, we're not, we'll come back to the other verses, but I want you to see. And the Redeemer shall come to Zion. And unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. In other words, the Lord will come. He will come and he will deliver and he will redeem them. And so it says, his, his, back in verse 16, his arm brought salvation to him. His righteousness, is, it sustained him. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation upon his head. And he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. So it's describing the warrior redeemer who is going to come out of heaven to deliver his people. And of course, he's going to do it righteously. Everything he does is in perfect righteousness. And so he's going to come putting on righteousness as a breastplate a helmet of salvation. Uh, his mind is going to be concerned with the salvation of his people, the deliverance of his people. It's going to be taken up with that. And so the helmet of salvation on his head, garment of vengeance upon his enemies. Uh, those enemies are going to be defeated as he comes and takes vengeance on him, on them. And zeal as a cloak. The word zeal has the idea of, uh, from a root word, means to be deep red. And so fiery zeal is going to be flushed with redness and zeal as he comes to save his people. And he comes at the same time to crush and defeat his enemies. 
And it's interesting how Paul would take these pieces of armor and talk to us about them in Ephesians chapter 6, that we, to do battle, are to be like the Lord Jesus. We're to put on the breastplate of righteousness. We put on the helmet of salvation. And one thing that Paul doesn't mention, but I think it's pretty important, he didn't mention in, in Ephesians 6, zeal for a cloak. But I want to say, you can have the best armor in the world, but if you've got no zeal, you're not going to be much of a soldier. And so the Lord, he had great zeal to accomplish his purposes, to redeem his people, and to put down his enemies. And so it says, according, verse 18, to their deeds, accordingly he will repay fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies, to the islands he will repay recompense. Because the islands is descriptive of the Gentiles. Back in Genesis 10, it talks about the isles of the Gentiles. Yeah, all the nations are going to be gathered to destroy Israel in the last days. And he is going to come and destroy these that come against his people, Israel. And so it says, when the enemy comes in like a flood, uh, when it seems like all hope is lost, when Israel is surrounded, uh, then the Lord will come, as it were, like the the, the seventh cavalry, so to speak, out of heaven, riding on a white horse. He'll come with zeal. He'll come and deliver his people from their enemies. And he'll come to Zion. And unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. Now notice, he's going to act in righteousness. He's not going to deliver all the Jews. Because we're going to read that in the tribulation, two-thirds of them are going to be wiped out. But... He's going to save the faithful remnant. And he's going to come to Zion and to them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. In other words, it's going to be that remnant that are left. That are going to be crying out and praying, roaring like the bear, as we read earlier. And they're going to be doing that. They're going to be surrounded by their enemies. And they're going to be crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, save now, save now. And the Lord's going to come out to Zion and deliver them. And they'll look on him whom they've pierced, Zechariah would tell us. And they'll mourn for him as one mourns for his only son. And so it says, as for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord. Speaking of the new covenant described in Jeremiah 31. He says, my spirit that is upon thee. And of course, he's going to put his spirit in the nation of Israel. These repentant ones that are born again in one day. And it says, my words, which I have put in your mouth, shall not depart out of your mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever. The nation that is going to enter into the full blessings of millennial glory that we're going to see in chapter 60, they're going to be a changed people. God's word will never, ever again depart out of their mouth or out of the mouth of their seed, or their seed seed. They are going to be loyal to their God, love him and serve him throughout the millennial reign and throughout eternity. And so, as we bring these things to a close, I want to just say this, that there is a day coming when Israel will be redeemed. The word redeemer here is the word for kinsman redeemer. It's a wonderful word. Uh, it, and the Lord Jesus became that kinsman redeemer, didn't he? Uh, he? You see, a kinsman redeemer must be in a position to redeem. He must be a near kinsman. And uh, we just remembered at Christmas time, he took on humanity in order to redeem us. Uh, he came and the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. And so he must be in a position to redeem. He must have the ability to redeem. He must be able to pay the penalty or the price in full, the full redemption price. And the Lord Jesus is more than able to pay the full price, the full penalty of sin because of his sinless life and his precious blood. And then he must have the desire to redeem. And of course, he had that desire. Uh, here am I, send me, he says. He loved the human race. God so loved the world, he gave his only son. And the Lord Jesus willingly came. And so this kinsman redeemer, he came 
to deal with not just the nation of Israel, but the nations. He came to set men free, to deliver the captives. He came to set at liberty those that are bound. He came to change society from one that is filled with wickedness to one that's filled with righteousness. Right now, God is still saving Jews, but not the whole nation. He's going to do that in the last days. And he's still saving people. And how is he saving people? Well, exactly the way he's going to save Israel in the last days. There has to first be that conviction of sin. Has to be an acknowledgement of the seriousness of sin. All of sin then comes short of the glory of God. And then there must be a confession of sin. There must be an acknowledgement. I have sinned against you, Lord. It's sin is serious. And then there must be faith in the Redeemer, the Lord Jesus the one who came, willing to be that kinsman redeemer, shed his precious blood on Calvary so that men might be saved. And if you've never trusted Christ, this would be a great way to start this new year with a genuine, real, old-fashioned conversion. Acknowledging, yes, I've sinned. My hands are guilty. I've done things I shouldn't do. My lips, I've said things I should never have said. My hands... My, my, my tongue, my feet have been to places they ought not to have been. And I confess, Lord, that I'm a rotten, hell-deserving sinner. And I trust thee, Lord Jesus, as the only deliverer, the glorious Savior, the one who died on Calvary's cross, shed his precious blood, was buried and rose again so that I might be saved. May that be true of all of us. And may this be a year that we have those beautiful feet, not swift to shed innocent blood, but swift to proclaim the message of the one who was innocent and shed his blood on Calvary's cross. May God encourage us with these thoughts. Amen. All right. Thanks, Mike. You appreciate that. But maybe we'll just uh, close the meeting in a word of prayer and then uh, we can dismiss from here. Our God and our Father, we're thankful for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who, as we've heard, was uh, innocent yet charged guilty uh, for our sins. And uh, we thank you for uh, this amazing price that was paid on the cross at Calvary for the sins of the whole world. And uh, we thank you, Lord, that uh, you do hear us and uh, that you are still saving those who would come to you, who would uh, recognize their sin, would confess it, and then put their faith and trust in you. And so we just ask, Lord, as we've been encouraged here, that our feet would be swift to take this good news. Uh, in a world full of bad news, uh, we have the good news. And so would you encourage encourage our hearts, Lord, to share that good news uh, with each person we come in contact with. And so we want to give you thanks and commit this time together, commit our brother Mike to you this week, that you would encourage his heart and, and bless him and Anne-Marie, we pray. We give you thanks in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.